All right, moving on to chapter seven and immunity. So first, let's start off with a little bit of an immune system review. Our responsible, um, responsible for body defenses, we have our nonspecific responses or our defense mechanisms, and these include the phagocytosis as well as inflammation. And um, you guys know phagocytosis to me, they're like little Pac-Men, <laughs> right? They go wah, 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 and they eat up the debris or whatever they're targeted, right? Um, and then you also have specific responses, which again is a defense mechanism. And this is where you have the production of specific antibodies against foreign substances. Um, so when we're talking about com components of the immune system, this is on page 115 in your book, you have your lymphoid structures, which include your lymph nodes, your spleen, your tonsils, your intestinal lymphoid tissue, and also your lymphatic circulation. And then you have your immune cells, and these would be like your lymphocytes and your macrophages. Uh, you have tissues that are involved in immune cell development, and these include your bone marrow and your thymus. Your bone marrow is the origination of all immune cells, so it's very, very important. And then also your thymus is um, responsible for the maturation of your T lymphocytes. You also have chemical mediators or helpers, and that would be your histamine and your interleukin. <clears throat> so when we're looking at structures of the immune system, this is on page 115, figure 7.1. And it points out that you have your pharyngeal, uh, uh, pharyngeal tonsil, which is your adenoid, adenoid. You have your palatine tonsil. You have your lymph nodes in the cervical area. You have your lymphatic vessels. You have your thymus, which is there. You have your lymph nodes, which are auxiliary organ. You have your spleen. You have your lymph nodes in your intestine. You have your inguinal lymph, lymph nodes around the groin area, and then also you have your bone marrow. Um, so when we're looking at elements of the immune system, you have antigens, you have self antigens, and you have non-self antigens. Self antigens are going to be um, you, the present, present on the individual cell plasma membrane. So they're like HeLa proteins that label cells of the individual. They're also immune system. Um, is going to ignore self cells so that we don't attack ourselves. So that's pretty cool. Because uh, oh, actually, there are some diseases, the autoimmune diseases, where that you attack your own body, and that's very, very not cool. But these are explained on page 115. Then you also have your non self um, ones, and these are where, is where the immune system is going to recognize um, specific non, -spec non self antigens as foreign and it develops a specific response to that particular antigen. And then also memory cells are produced to respond quickly to that antigen. Um, immunogens are usually exogenous substances and they also have cell surface antigens. <clears throat> and these include proteins, polysaccharides, as well as glycoproteins. So looking at our cells specifically, all right, um, we are looking at macrophages. And again, this is um, discussed on page 115. So the macrophages are have the initiation of the immune response. They also develop from monocytes. They are part of the mononuclear phagocytotic system. They engulf foreign material. They display antigens of foreign material. They also secrete chemicals such as monokines and interleukins and they are present through the entire body. So these are good guys. We also have lymphocytes. And an example of this would be your T lymphocytes. And these come from bone marrow stem cells. They're further differentiated in the thymus. This just means they grow up in the thymus and they become mature. Um, they're cell mediated um, immunity. They also have cytotoxic T killer cells. You have helper T cells, and then you also have memory T cells. With your lymphocytes specifically, um, you have B lymphocytes, and these are bone ones, right? So B stands for bone. So these are responsible for the production of your antibodies, and they're humoral immunity, and they are found in mature bone marrow, and they then proceed to the spleen and to the lymphoid tissue. We also have um, plasma cells, right? And these produce antibodies, and we ha also have B memory cells. And these can quickly form clone of plasma cells. So these are like the soldiers that are ready to go into battle to help keep us nice and healthy. Okay. Um, 
For the types of immunity, you have humoral immunity, and this is where the antibodies are produced in order to protect the body. Then you also have cell-mediated immunity, um, and this is where the lymphocytes are programmed to attack the non-self cells, so like the invaders, in order to protect the body. Okay, so we're, we have a, kind of like a one-two punch, right? So we're going to try to keep our body as healthy as we can. So looking at the development of cellular and humoral immunities, this is figure 7.2 in your book on page 117. So you can see up here in figure 1, you have lymphoblasts, um, and these are bone marrow step cells, stem cells. And then that branches off, and this word is maturation. So they mature, they grow up to become um, you know, cells either in the thymus or in the bone marrow. So let's follow the thymal um, gland here first. So from the thymus, and then they branch off into T cells, and then they're going to migrate to your lymph nodes, and then um, the antigen can stimulate those um, cells there. And then you have various different types of uh, sensitized T cells that are in circulation. So you have helper T cells, memory T cells, suppressor T cells, and cytotoxic T cells. And so the presence is required then to um, help fight off the um, intruder. If we go down here, then we have the mature cells go to the bone marrow, and then these uh, develop into B cells, where they're going to migrate again to those lymph nodes. And then again, we have that foreign substance that's going to be coming in. We have a processed antigens and then microphages. And honestly, guys, you have to look at this figure because it's really cute. It looks like a guy with the really big googly eyes. It looks like a funny cartoon. All right, so um, the antigen stimulation, and again, that leads to the plasma cells, therefore producing an antibody or memory B cells, and then it's going to be binding sites for the specific antigen, and then we have our antibody that's going to be in circulation with either the constant region or the variable region, with the variable region, region being binding sites for that specific antigen. So again, that's figure 7.2 on page 117. So when talking about antibodies and immunoglobins, we have IgG, and this is the most common in blood. You have IgM, and this is the first to increase in the immune response. You also have IgA, and this is found in secretions such as tears, saliva, and mucous membranes, as well as colostrum. You have IgE, and this is responsible for your allergic responses, and this causes the release of histamine and other chemicals into your body. And this therefore results in inflammation. You also have IgD, and these are attached to B cells and also activates B cells. So here is a great little table of the major components of the immune system and their function. And so this is table 7.1 on page 116. So this is just a great little summary. These would be fantastic to turn into flashcards so that you can flip through them and just really learn all of this stuff. But again, this is on page 116, and um, it's just a great summary of all of the major components of the immune system, as well as their functions. Um, talking about the complement system, this is activated during immune reactions with um, IgG. Um, yep. So this is going to be on page um, 118, guys, on the very bottom left. So um, the complement system is frequently activated during an immune reaction with IgG or IgM class immunoglobulins. Um, the complement involves a group of inactive proteins numbered C1 through C9 that circulates in the blood. When an antigen antibody complex binds to the first component, uh, complement component C1, a sequence of activating steps occur, which is similar to like the blood clot clotting cascade. Um, and eventually this activation of the uh, complement system results in the destruction of the antigen by lysis or splitting it apart, right? Um, when the cell membrane is damaged or some complement fragment may attach to a microorganism, um, making, uh, marking it for the phagocytosis. And then the complement activation is also initiated by an inflammation response, okay? So that's a nice little response. Um, with your chemical mediators, this is a number of chemical mediators such as histamine or interleukins that can be involved in immune reactions depending on the particular circumstances. Um, these chemicals have a variety of different functions as seen in signaling cellular responses or causing cellular damage, and that's talked about in chapter five. Um, and then there's a brief summary of this that is um, 
uh, summarized again in Table 7.1, which was um, that big table that I just showed you two slides ago. Okay, so there are a variety of functions, including signaling and causing cellular damage. Um, so what about diagnostic tests? Diagnostic tests are discussed on page 119. You have a titer, and this is going to measure the level of the serum immunoglobulins. You can have an indirect Combs test, and this detects the Rh blood incompatibility. And the Rh factors are what makes you A positive, O, B positive, AB, you know, the different types of blood, right? You can do an ELISA. I used to do these in my lab. It was fun. And these can uh, detect HIV antibodies. They can also be used for a whole bunch of other, other diseases. This is just a way to actually... Um, it measures protein expression and protein function. Well, not, not function, but the level of protein expression. You can also do MHC typing, and this is tissue matching that occurs before transplantation um, procedures so that you can reduce the um, rate of rejection. Um, so what about immunity? You have natural immunity, which is going to be um, specific, right, species-specific. Then you can also have innate, innate immunity, and this would be gene-specific, and it's related to ethnicity. Um, you have a primary response, and this is the first exposure that occurs with the antigen, and this is one to two weeks before the antibody titer reaches efficiency. So, like, we can talk about this with COVID shots, right? Like, I just got my first COVID shot last weekend, last Saturday, and so I get my second dose in three weeks. So after about two weeks, two to three weeks, I should start to see antibodies be present in my body because of this, you know, titer, right? So it'll take one to two weeks before it, like, I have antibodies in my body to start being able to fight off the COVID um, virus. A secondary response would be a repeat exposure to the same antigen. You have a more rapid response with efficacy within one to three days. And so this is kind of why the second dose is there, because they really make sure that your fighter cells are ready to go and fight off COVID-19 if you get exposed to it. Um, looking at primary and secondary immune responses, this is figure 7.3. And this would be just a graph it's like illustrating primary and secondary immune responses. So if we're exposed to antigen A, the primary antigen A response is whoop, up here. And then if you're re-exposed to it, then you have a secondary, more intense response like we just talked about. Um, we have active natural immunity, and this occurs from natural exposure to the antigen and the development of antibodies. Then we also have active artificial immunity, and this is where the antigen is purposefully introduced into the body, like the COVID vaccine, mumps, measles, rubella, all of the shots that we get growing up. Um, and this is um, used to stimulate antibody production. And again, this is your uh, your shots and your booster shots. So when we're talking about um, passive natural immunity, this is where the IgG is transferred from the mother to the fetus across the placenta. And also this can occur through breast milk. And the protection in the infant is for the first few months of life or until they're weaned. And so actually they're starting to see that mothers that are vaccinated for COVID can pass these immune, uh, this immunity on to babies. And so they're starting to vaccinate pregnant mothers now too, so that their babies can be um, have a little bit of immunity when they first come out. You can also have passive artificial immunity. And this again is going to be the injection of the antibodies. And this would be for short-term production. Um, so there are a couple different types of the acquired immunity, and this is summarized in Table 7.3, which is found on page 120 in your book. And so you can have natural active, artificial active, natural passive, or artificial pass passive, and then these are the mechanisms, um, whether or not it forms cellular memory, and a couple um, examples, like chicken pots, measles, um, the placental passage, or gamma globulin, if there was a recent exposure to a microbe, etc. So what about the outcome of infectious diseases? Some occurrences um, have, there have been some occurrences um, that were, have declined where vaccination rates are high. So we have previous infections. This is talked about a whole bunch right now in the media, is this herd immunity. 
and outbreaks such as measles and mumps in North America due to inadequate revaccination of teens. So basically, what does this mean? It means that people got their first shot, they didn't get their second shot, shot, and then we had an outbreak of something that was considered cured or not around anymore because we have vaccination against them. Right. And so we're trying to get what, like, what is it, 70, 75 percent of the population vaccinated with um, for COVID so that we can develop that herd immunity. OK. Um, we're also in the search for additional vaccinations, and this continues. And some of the ones that they're targeting is AIDS, malaria, TB and other diseases and also research on genetic vaccines. And so, again, right now, these these slides were made before COVID was a thing. Okay, COVID's been around since like 1918, but before it was a pandemic, right? And so, um, you know, COVID would be right in here. It was being researched already, but then they fast-tracked the production of um, the vaccination that had already started um, because they knew that we needed it sooner rather than later. So what about emerging and re-emerging? And this is on page 121 in your book. We have emerging infectious diseases, and these are newly identified in a population. This would be COVID. Or re-emerging infectious diseases that were previously under control with no um, consistency in the vaccination programs. And they can be on a rise due, global, due to globalization, <clears throat> drug resistance, or other factors. And again, an example would be a re-outbreak of measles. We, if we went centuries without really talking about measles, but now, um, and everyone has their own choice, so I'm not picking on anyone by saying this, but there are anti-vaxxers now that aren't getting any vaccinations. They're choosing not to, and so it's making measles a thing again because um, there are many children that are not vaccinated or people that didn't get a booster shot, right? Um, unfortunately, people are mean, and the world can be a cruel, cruel place, and so there are people that can use this information for bioterrorism, and this is talked about on page 121 in your book, where biologic agents are used to attack civilians and or military personnel. And they may use altered antigenic forms of common viruses or bacteria. And you can cause widespread impact on a population due to the lack of vaccinations. We saw the scrambling right now. I mean, it, bioterrorism was not with COVID, but we can see what happened when there's a lack of vaccination and lack of preparedness, right? There's a little bit of a panic. Um, what about tissue and organ transplant or rejection? This is talked about on the bottom right of page 121. And so you can have hyperacute rejection, and this occurs immediately after the transplantation. You can have acute rejection, and this develops after several weeks. Or you can have chronic or late rejection, and this occurs after several months or years. So people that get organ transplants, they have to take anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life just to try to prevent chronic or late rejection of organ transplants. So how can we treat this and how can we prevent it? Well, you can use immunosuppression techniques and these would be used to reduce the immune response and also to prevent the rejection. You can do drug treatments and these would be through careful dosing to prevent kidney damage because you know once you're putting something in your body your kidney's going to try to filter it out and if you overtax it then you can cause permanent damage to your kidneys which is not cool and then also there are a lot of different drugs um in clinical trials that we're trying to get um get out so people can actually use them right um so what about immunosuppression well, this is the reduction of uh, um, I'm trying to find this in your book. Reduction of the immune response to prevent the rejection, and commonly, commonly, commonly um, used drugs would be cyclosporine, erythrosporine, or prednisone. And um, with immunosuppression, there is a high risk of infection that is caused by immunosuppression. Immunosuppression literally means your immune system is suppressed. So your fighters, your soldiers, aren't up at, up for battle and therefore can cause a lot of um, diseases that can occur. And, you know, normally your body could fight it off with infections, diseases, whatever. But since you're immunosuppressed, you don't have your fighters there um, being able to fight you off. And so also these are called opportunistic organisms. It's like, oh, hey, you're down for the count. Let's like attack you right now and we'll be fun. Okay. Um, what about hypersensitivity reactions? And this is on page 122. Also, immunosuppression was on 122. And so we have type 1 hypersensitivity, which would be allergic reactions. 
Commons would be common ones would be caused by an allergen, skin rashes, hay fever. Um, you can have a causative mechanism, which would be exposure to the allergens, uh, the development of those IgEs, and also um, mast cell maturation. And you could also have complications that can occur, such as anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis. So, like growing up, my brother was um, or still is allergic to hay. Um, and so he would get hay fever, right? And we live in the country and we have animals. And so we always like did hay and stuff. And so um, we always, we had air conditioning growing up and everything. So we had to really make sure that the windows were closed and that my brother didn't really help with haying because um, he'd get really sick, right? Because he was allergic to it. Um, type one hypersensitivity continued. We have the high hay fever, which I was just talking about. And this is allergic rhino, um, uh, rhino, rhinitis. And this would be uh, affecting the nasal mucosa, right? You have food allergies, and these would be in your digestive tract mucosa. You have atopic dermatitis or eczema, and this is affecting your skin. Or you have asthma, and this can affect your bronchial, um, the bronchioles in your lung, uh, the bronchial mucosa. So looking at type 1 hypersensitivity, this is on page 124 in your book. This is figure 7.4. And so up here it says that you have your first exposure to the uh, red allergen. And then it goes to your immune system. And in step 2 here, the IgE forms. And then the mast cells and the basophils are found in the tissue. And then they come and they link together. And then you have your sensitized mast and cells and the basophils um, that are there and ready to go. And then you can have a secondary exposure to it. And then you already have your prepared guys ready here to fight. And so they release the mediators such as histamine. And then this causes an in inflammation and that can cause a vasodilation and increased permeability of the blood vessels. And then this can lead to edema, which is like that tissue swelling, redness, and putritis. So if things go too far and are too severe, then it can lead in, uh, to anaphylaxis, which is also known as anaphylactic shock. And so this can be severe and life-threatening, and this is a systemic hypersensitivity reaction, and it's decreased um, blood pressure that's caused by a release of histamine. It can cause airway obstruction. It can cause severe hypoxia. It can be caused by latex insects, stings, nuts, shellfish, various drugs. So my sister-in-law has a latex allergy. And she's a lab scientist. She's a PhD uh, botanist. She's awesome. She can't wear latex gloves. She has to have nitrile gloves, right? Um, she was in the hospital. I stupidly brought her like latex balloons. Thankfully, they started um, banning them from hospitals because there's just a lot of people that have latex allergies. But we have to be really careful to not bring her balloons and stuff. Um, my brother is allergic to shellfish. <laughs> I am starting to get an allergy to those sesame sticks, which I love, but my tongue swells up. Um, my brother's also allergic to baby carrots, but not real carrots. So it's just because of the preservative that they use on it and stuff. So I don't know. My husband's allergic to my cat. He's sleeping so cute over there and dust and a lot of different things. Okay. Obviously, uh, Steve's gone a little, my brother's gone a little where we've had to be very careful. He has an EpiPen and stuff like that. So it can be really bad. Um, signs and, sim and symptoms include generalized itching and tingling, especially in the oral cavity, coughing, difficulty breathing, feeling of weakness, dizziness or fainting, a sense of fear or panic, edema or the swelling around the eyes, lips, tongue, hands, and feet it can also cause hives, and it can also cause a collapse with a loss of consciousness. So if we're looking at the effects of anaphylaxis, this is figure 7.5 on page 126 in your book. Up here, you have a second or subsequent exposure to an antigen. And then um, the antigen is going to bind here with the IgE antibodies. And then the mast cells are going to release a large amount of histamine into the general circulation. And then that can go on to affect your cardiovascular, your skin, or your lungs, those different systems. If we're talking about the cardiovascular system, um, then it can cause vasodilation and therefore increased um, capillary permeability, which can lead to decreased blood pressure, which can lead you to be cause you to faint or feel very weak. And then it can lead down here to severe oxygen deficit in the brain. If it's affecting your skin, well, then this is going to affect the nerve endings and it can lead to itching. 
when it affects your lungs over here, it can um, cause the smooth muscles to contract, causing edema and the mucus uh, together there. And then it can cause the constriction of the bronchioles um, and the release of the mucus in your lungs. And then this can cause your airways to become obstructed. It can cause cough and also dyspnea, dyspnea. Oh my God, I can't talk. Dyspnea. And then also this can therefore again lead to severe oxygen deficiency in the brain. Sorry. I'm going to pause here for a second. All right. Sorry. All right. So here are signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and this is figure 7.6 on page 125 of your book and so again this would be um, you know great just quizzing yourself with um, flashcards or whatever but it has manifestations as well as what's happening in the body to cause it so how do we treat this well it requires first aid response and if you have one you should um, you should administer an EpiPen if it's available um, and also call 911 because many paramedics can start drug treatment and oxygen until they can get you to the hospital. And then when you get to the hospital in the ER or ED, um, hopefully not, well, both. So they can give you epinephrine, they can give you glucocorticoids, they can give you antihistamines, they can give you oxygen, and they can also help to stabilize your blood pressure. <laughs> when you're talking about type 2, this is going to be talking about cytotoxic um, hypersensitivity, and this is on page 126 in your book. So this is when the antigen is present on the cell membrane, and it may be in the normal body component, or it can be exogenous. And <coughs> this is where circulating IgGs react with the antigen, and it causes destruction by phagocytosis or cytolytic enzymes. And an example of this would be a response to an, an incompatible blood transfusion. <coughs> so this is always why they have the blood type you. So here's a diagram of type 2 hypersensitivity, which would be that cytotoxic reaction. And this is figure 7.6 in your book on page 127. So up here, you have anti-A antibodies in the type B blood that are going to mix with the type A blood um, and attach to um, the target cell with the surface uh, antigen. So this would be like an, a red blood cell type A and then the surface antigen type A. And then with the target cell with the surface antigen, this is going to be causing the complement to become activated. And then step four down here would be the lysis or the busting apart of the cell of the red blood cell. And that would be the type A uh, red blood cell. And then here you have the destroyed red blood cell. And then that Pac-Man phagocyte comes in and it Pac-Mans it, right? It eats it up and it digests it and get rid of, get, gets rid of it. And so that would be a diagram of the type 2 hypersensitivity. Um, talking about type 3, this is on page 127, where you have immune complex hypersensitivity. This is where the antigen combines with the antibody, and it forms immune complexes that are deposited in the tissue, causes an activation of the complement system, and then the process causes inflammation and tissue destruction. And examples of this would be glomerulonephritis, and then also rheumatoid arthritis, which we talked about this week, guys, a little bit. Well, the effect of rheumatoid arthritis on, on the circulatory system, etc. So, talking about um, immune complex reaction, this is figure 7.7, .7, and this is type 3 hypersensitivity, um, the immune complex reaction. So basically over here in step one, the antibody is going to bind to the antigen, and then the immune complexes form in the circulation, and then these complexes are going to deposit in the blood vessels of the tissue, and it causes the activation of the complement. Then down here, you have the inflammatory response that happens at the site of the deposit. And then this causes the release of the lysosomal enzymes and the chemical mediators. And then that's what causes the tissue damage Okay, that you can see here. Um, with type 4, this would be the cell-mediated or delayed hypersensitivity. And this is um, discussed on page 127 in your book. <coughs> um, you have a delayed response by sensitized T lymphocytes, and you also have the release of lymphokinins. Um, this causes an inflammatory response and also a destruction of the antigen. Examples, examples, you like that. Examples would be uh, the tuberculin test, 
contact dermatitis or allergic skin rashes. So here is a figure showing this one. And this is figure 7.8 in your book on page 129. And so up here you have the macrophage that's going to be presented to the antigen. So the antigen is this orange square here. And then you have your host T lymphocyte. And then here in step two, you have the sensitiv sensitivization. You, you're activating, right? The T lymphocyte. The T lymphocyte is going to uh, rep replicate, re uh, Mm -hmm. reproduce right it's going to divide and then it causes the release of the lymphokinins and then you also have inflammation on, and lysis of the antigen bearing cells of the tissue and then down here it causes the tissue destruction <coughs> i have a tickle in my throat i'm sorry guys All right when i'm talking about autoimmune disorders these start on page 128 this is when we have the development of antibodies against our own cells or tissues uh, we have those autoantibodies are antibodies that are formed against our self antigens and therefore we have a loss of self tolerance this disorder can affect single organs or tissues or it can also be generalized and examples of this can be hashimotos uh, so specifically hashimoto thyroiditis systemic lupus erythromatosis rheumatic fever myasthenia gravis scleroderma pernicious anemia and others um, so when we're talking about the autoimmune process, um, this is 7.9 in your book on page 130. Um, up here you have the, your normal immune response where you have your first exposure and you have the invaders, which would be the antigens, and then it causes your antibodies to form in step two. And then you can have a secondary exposure. And then down here in step three, the antibodies are going to remove the invading antigens. And then in step four, <clears throat> the antibody remains there for future protection. But what happens in autoimmune diseases is that the immune system um, forms antibodies to the self antigens, the ones that are supposed to be in our body. And then it starts attacking itself, right? So the autoantibodies attack self antigens and the immune complexes deposit. And then uh, step three here is it causes inflammation and tissue damage to occur, right? So you just basically start attacking your own body. So talking about systemic uh, lupus or SLE, um, erythematosus, and so this is on page 128. So it is a chronic inflammatory disease that affects a number of systems. Therefore, it can be very different and difficult to diagnose and treat. The name of the systemic uh, disorder is derived from the characteristic facial rash, which is erythematosus, and it occurs across the nose and the cheeks, and it resembles the markings of a wolf, which is um, the lupus, right? So that's where you get the picture or the lupus from. This is a picture of it, okay? So you can see kind of the wolf-like butterfly rash. Um, <clears throat> the rash is often referred to as butterfly rash, reflecting its distribution, conditions becoming better known and more cases are identified early. Certain drugs can cause lupus-like syndromes, which then disappears when you stop using those drugs. Um, discoid lupus erythematosus is a less serious version of the disease. It's only affecting the skin. Um, it's uncertain because many cases are probably not diagnosed in early stages. Systemic lupus um, affects primarily women and becomes um, manifested between ages 10 and 50, and the incidence is higher in um, African American, Asians, Hispanic, and Native Americans. Um, so this is a picture of again that butterfly rash, and this is 7.10 on page 130. Um, there are a large number of circulating antibodies, autoantibodies, that um, are targeted against the DNA, platelets, and erythrocytes. Um, it causes the formation of immune complexes that are then deposited into the tissues, and then this causes inflammation and necrosis or the cell death. And then the vasculitis can develop in many organs, and because that's going to be an inflammation of the vascular system that you know is damaged, it can impair the blood supply to those tissues. Signs and symptoms vary because the organ of development, but commonly they include erythralgia, um, fatigue, malaise, uh, cardiovascular problems, polyuria, 
um, diagnostic tests that we can use to diagnose these would be serum antibodies, the, looking for the LE cells, as well as blood works. <clears throat> um, you can also have treatments, and these would be usually treated by a rheumatologist because they're specialized in this, um, using prednisone, which is a glucocorticoid, or also non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And so this is a table of the common manifestations of um, systemic lupus erythematosus, and this is on page 131, and it is table 7.7. .7. So you can see that it affects the joints, skin, kidneys, lungs, heart, blood vessels, central nervous system, as well as the bone marrow. Okay. <clears throat> when we're talking about immunodeficiency, this is discussed on page 131. This is where you have a partial or total loss of one or more immune system components. And there, this causes an increased risk of infection and cancer. And there are a lot of primary deficiencies that occur because of this. And um, this, the basic developmental failure occurs somewhere in this system um, because of these deficiencies. There are also secondary or acquired immunodeficiencies. And these include the loss of the immune response for, from a specific cause. And unfortunately, these can occur at any time during the lifespan. And these can be causing infections, a splenectomy, malnourishment, malnutrition, liver disease, immunosuppressant drugs, radiation, chemotherapy, and cancer can all cause these as well. Um, it can also cause a predisposition to the development of other opportunistic infections, which would be caused by normal flora. So the things that are normally in your body that say, hey, we no longer have like a supervisor here. Let's take off and go crazy. Right. And it can cause um, opportunistic infections that normally your body would fight off. Um, usually these are difficult to treat because of the immunodeficiency. And so we prophylactically <clears throat> use antimicrobial drugs um, to prior to any invasive procedures, right? So you can take antibiotics before you have like a dental implant or something like that, right? So what about AIDS? So when I was growing up, it was, this was a new thing and it was like just being found out about, right? And so now a lot of people know about it and there's movies about it and a lot more information about it and it's not a lethal condition anymore. Um, but it's still very important to talk about. So this is talked about on page 132 in your book. <clears throat> so AIDS is a chronic infectious disease that's caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Um, HIV itself destroys those helper T cells um, and the CD4 lymphocytes, and this can cause a loss of immune response. And so because of this, you have an increased susceptibility to the secondary infections and also cancer. And in AIDS, there is a prolonged latent period and um, the de development <coughs> thankfully, of HIV AIDS can be suppressed by antivirals. So with an HIV positive individual, <clears throat> the virus is known to be in the body and there is no evidence of immunosuppression where when it becomes full blown AIDS, it is, has marked clinical symptoms and also multiple complications. And <clears throat> um, the individual is often identified as HIV positive before they actually develop into full blown AIDS. And so there are current therapies that we can start if the HIV infection is diagnosed in the early stages. Charlie Sheen came out saying that he had um, HIV, right? And so he's on a cocktail of drugs, and I think he's relatively healthy and still living his life. Um, so stages in the development of AIDS are diagrammed here. This is figure 7.12 on page 133. The screen line up here is the normal CD4 cells, and this is time over years. And then you have your antibodies that are going to form. And then you also have viremia, so your virulence factor. And so you have um, exposure that occurs here. You have seroconversion. Um, and this would be like your window, window period where the virus is in the blood, but you don't have any antibodies and you have very mild symptoms. Then you can um, go to HIV positive. And this is where more antibodies form. And there are small amounts of virus that are present in the blood and you are still asymptomatic. Then it goes into full-blown aid, AIDS. And this is where you have the active infection and a decreased CD4 count. And then the AIDS indicator diseases, which include those opportunistic infections, lymphedema, 
wasting sim symptoms, as well as dementia. So talking a little bit about the history of AIDS, which by the way, Dallas Flyers Clubs, it's a rated R movie, right? But it's a fantastic movie and it's all about like when it first came out and like treatment and stuff. It has um, Michael McConaughey, Matthew, Matthew McConaughey in there. Um, it's a fantastic movie. So if you've not seen it, don't watch it with little kids around, but um, it's a great movie. Um, but anyway, the first case was recognized in 1979, and um, HIV was identified in 1984, and it, there was evidence of earlier sporadic cases, and it's now considered to be a pandemic because it is world uh, widespread. Um, it does occur in both men and women, and in 2006, the CDC reported there were 1 million cases in North America, where in 2007, the UN reported that there are 33 million cases globally. 22 million of those are sub in sub-Saharan Africa. In um, 2014, the CDC reported that 44% of the cases of AIDS in, uh, in the United States were um, African-American individuals. 27 were Caucasian. Uh, 23 were Hispanic, 2% were Asian or Pacific Islander, and then 1% were American Indian or Alaskan Indigenous people. So the agent is the human immunodeficiency virus. It is a retrovirus and a member of the subfamily lentivirus. Um, HIV-1 is the major cause of AIDS in U.S. and Europe, where HIV-2 strain is the major cause of AIDS in Central Africa. How is this transmitted? Um, well, at first they really didn't know, but now we know it's blood, semen, and vaginal fluids. Okay, so this is why, you know, with sex, like I said, it can cause microabrasions. And so, you know, you should always wear protection, right? Um, and this is one of the reasons because with microabrasions or tears um, on either the vagina or the penis, right, it can cause even more transmission than just regular fluids, right? So it can go do your blood as well with those micro tears. Um, so for diagnostic tests, we have the presence of the HIV in infection. You have a blood test for HIV antibodies. You have three stages for the process. Uh, and this is the presence of HIV one, which is uh, one and two, the antigen antibody. Um, you have the differentiation or identification between HIV one and two antibodies. Then you can also do a nucleic acid test to confirm HIV one positive and also eliminate a false negative okay so they might do a bedside test but before they really tell you anything they're going to do a confirmatory test um with uh nucleic your dna right to make sure that they're not giving you a false positive reaction some common effects of aids this is on page 137 in your book on figure 7.15 so you can have your brain can have memory loss, confusion, dementia, and infections such as toxoplasmosis, herpes, and lymphoedema, or lymphoma, I'm sorry, in your mouth and esophagus. You can have conitidis um, and herpes simplex virus. You can have lymphedemalopathy, and this would be a generalized problem of your lymph nodes. Um, in your lungs, you can have pneumonia or tuberculosis. In your GI system, you can have chronic diarrhea, infections, um, wasting disease, and anorexia. In your skin, you can have dermatitis, infections, and Kerposi sacoma. And then also in your blood, you can have uh, the Verima uh, HIV, and then also the decreasing count of those helper T cell lymphocytes. With clinical signs and symptoms, you have generalized effects, and this would be the lymphadenopathy. <laughs> you can have fatigue and weakness, going to have headache, uh, arthralgia. You can have GI effects primarily due to opportunistic infections. You can also have encephalopathy, and this is sometimes called AIDS dementia, and this is a direct infection of brain cells that would be caused by HIV. <clears throat> Some secondary infections, um, these are primarily the cause of death, and frequently these are multiple and more extensive and more severe than usual and drug treatment can often be ineffective. Um, in your lungs, you can have pneumonia. You can have cold sores that are caused by herpes simplex virus. You can have canidia, which involves the mouth and often the esophagus. And then you can also have tuberculosis. And so this is a picture of um, 
the pneumocytitis carni and sputum. Okay, and so this is um, a silver stain um, from a patient, and this is on page 138 in your book, um, figure 7.6. You can see the silver stain is um, staining the nuclei. And then you can also have um, the, this is the esophagus, right? And the thick greenish membrane is composed of the canidia hyphae and the purulent exudate. Um, you can uh, also have increased incidences of all cancers and also unusual cancers that are often markers for AIDS. And these are like Carposis sarcoma, where it, that affects the skin, the mucous membranes, and the internal organs. You can also have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and this is where you have purple or brown non-putritic painless patches, and eventually these become no nodular. And then this is an example of what the Carposis sarcoma can look like. You can see the splotches and the little cancer lesions, right? And again, this is figure 7.16 on page 138 of your book. And then the final slide is the treatment of AIDS. And this is where you use non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, or protease inhibitors. You can also use fusion inhibitors or CCR5 antagonists, which are your entry inhibitors, or you can use integrase strand transfer inhibitors. All right, we will see you guys in class. Have a good one.